morning, and welcome to New Hope. It is wonderful to be together. My name is Alan, and it's a privilege to serve the church in my role as the senior pastor to teach this morning on the theme of humility. Humility. I want more of this, and as soon as I talk about it or try to process it, it seems to disappear, doesn't it? If I come to you and I tell you, you are the most humble person I know, I've probably done you a disservice because your next thought will be, am I? And how on earth do I respond? And yet humility is such a profound opportunity for us. Thomas Merton refers to it as the most significant character quality for our spirituality, for our, for our growth in Christ. I want to talk about humility this morning in a way that I hope will help us to just nuance the concept a bit and think more deeply about how we can grow in humility. Because the passages that I'm going to read from Scripture this morning very clearly tell us to work on our humility, to be intentional and practical as we develop the muscles of a humble response to the world around us. So if you have your Bible, we're going to turn to 1 Peter, and we're going to read a few verses from the fifth chapter. Peter is addressing leaders in the churches in Asia Minor, scattered around that part of the world. Then he addresses those who are not leaders, those who don't have power positions. And then he addresses us all. And then he talks about the suffering in the church and the devil's work and how we can find a real sense of, of confidence in our faith. Right at the middle of all this, he talks about being humble. He talks about clothing ourselves with humility. He talks about, about choosing humility as a way of life, about being humble. So, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1. To the elders among you, I, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings, who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not holding it over, lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility towards one another, because God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. So much in that brief little passage to encourage us and invite us into this Christian walk. I want to make a distinction this morning between the shallow uh, uh, end and the deep end of the continuum of humility. There is a way of thinking about humility that is commonplace. It's what we all need to do. And then there is a, a way of engaging with humility that has to do with your calling. It has to do with your discipleship in Christ. And it is more specific to you. I want you to think this morning about your horse and your cross. Your horse and your cross. You're thinking, I don't have a horse. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. 
a commonplace idiom in our culture and a quote from Jesus to help us think about that aspect of humility that's for all of us and that aspect of humility that is a calling and so powerful in the Christian community. I want you to think about your horse. Get off your high horse. And I want you to think about your cross. Take up your cross and follow me. And these two expressions tell us a lot about humility and what we are invited into, about a commonplace experience, and about a Christ calling. And it's, it's good to think of them in slightly different ways. It will help you to process your, your actioning of humility. I want to be more humble. I really do. You need to be more humble. We together aspire to the humility of Christ. And anybody who is aware of Jesus' presence in their life aspires to humility. We know the value of it. And we know the importance of getting off our high horses so that we can engage in flourishing life experiences. The saying comes from the medieval period when a tax collector or a landowner or a, a, a law enforcement officer would come onto the property of a serf or a servant riding on their horse to collect the taxes, to enforce the law, to make it known who owns the property. And the bigger the responsibility, the bigger the, the power, the bigger the ego, the higher the horse. And so your high horse is the symbol, the picture of your status, your, your authority, your role. And of course, the saying developed, you know, there you are up there on your high horse, marching into my life with the law and ownership and taxation and authority. Get off your high horse and get down here where I am and see the struggles of life from my side of the issues. It's a great picture. It's a picture of humility. And it is what we are all called to do as we live our lives under the mighty hand of God to humble ourselves. It is what we are all called to do to make human relationships work and to honor and serve God. We need to see each other as worthy of respect. We need to see each other as people that we should, we should honor and engage with together. So, get off your high horse. When you go home and you have lunch and someone says, what did the preacher tell you today? He told me to get off my high horse. We need to, we need to engage in life in a way that we respect each other deeply. This is actually harder than it sounds. Simple to say, hard to do. Because to get off our high horses, for me to get off my high horse, means I have to, well, as, as, as Paul put it, think about others first. What is this person actually trying to say? Which means shutting down my narrative of what I think I just heard and what I want to say next. That's, that's a humble posture. What would it be like to be in this person's skin? What might they be going through? What might they be suffering? What might they be experiencing that I don't experience because I've got a high horse? What might, what might my response, human being to human being, be like if I really stood in their shoes? That's, that's a posture of humility. And this is what Paul says when he's writing to the church and he's saying to the leaders, be good shepherds. And he's saying to all the young people, honor the elders. And he's talking about the intergenerational divide and the power structures that exist in that ancient culture of patriarchy, where status was everything. Honor was everything. Shame was what you tried to avoid. And he says, here's what you need to do. Clothe yourselves with humility. It's just another way of saying, get off your high horse. See one another for, for who God has created you to be. That's the simple part of the message. Really hard to do, but it's the simple, straightforward part. As I was preparing, I, I looked at all kinds of definitions of humility, and what occurred to me is, we all know what humility is. You don't need a definition. It's intuitive. We know what it is. It's the challenge is to actually practice it, to actually do it. Humility simply means to just make myself lower than all my ego 
wants to be. Everything in me wants to be higher, bigger. I I have a moment and I don't quite feel safe, so I need you to know that I'm bigger than you thought I was. I'm, I'm brighter than you thought I was. I'm stronger than you thought I was. And that is pride, and God opposes the proud. But he gives grace to the humble. I want to take you to an Old Testament story where there was an individual who just would not get off his high horse. And consequently, God opposed him. And when people don't get off their high horse, a whole lot of people suffer. A whole lot of people suffer. It's an Old Testament story. It's in the book of Daniel. It's the story of uh, Belshazzar. He followed King Nebuchadnezzar. His dad was a ruler in Babylon with great power and strength. And the book of Daniel tells us that Nebuchadnezzar could pretty much rule as he wanted until God humbled him. And the book of Daniel is a wonderful narrative about power, leadership, absolute power, incredible corruption, and God, what, God, what, God, what God's work really looks like when it unfolds. So God confronts Nebuchadnezzar and, and winds him right down to the posture of an animal. It's an amazing story. His, his, his fingernails grow. His hair gets all feathered. He loses his mind. He's out in, in, in wilderness wild places and until he humbles himself and repents of his, his power plays and God restores him to leadership. That's Nebuchadnezzar. His son, Belshazzar, knows this story and it doesn't affect his behavior. He just acts like a pompous, entitled, rich, young uh, lord over everybody. And he decides he's going to have a big party. And so he invites a thousand of his friends, as you do. And he decides while they're all kind of in high spirits that they should take it to the next level. And he asks a servant to go and get all those silver and gold vessels that his father Nebuchadnezzar took from the temple in Jerusalem, bring them to the party, We're going to have a slosh happy time as we consume too much alcohol from those golden and silver goblets. And as they do this, they give praise to the gods of gold and silver. And while all of this is happening, so this is a man who is on his high horse. This is a man who is using his power not to help people, not to serve, He's not, he's not engaged with humanity, thinking about what is good for others. That's what leaders are supposed to do. That's what shepherds are meant to do. No, no, no. He's, he's all about himself. And while this wild party is happening, suddenly a hand appears over on, against the wall where the lamp is burning, just a hand, and it writes some words on the wall. Well, that was a party stopper. It says that Belshazzar went pale and his legs shook and his knees knocked. That's literally what it said. He's just a quaking mess. And so he he asks his wisest people, what do those words mean? Nobody knows. The queen comes in and she says, don't be be upset. I I know somebody who can answer this for you. Um, Daniel. He's, he interprets dreams. He does amazing stuff. Nebuchadnezzar really recognized him. Uh, he's probably old by now. We'll get him to come in. And so he comes in. He interprets the message. He tells Belshazzar what it says. And it is not good. But before he tells him what it says, he rehearses the whole history that I've just given you. Nebuchadnezzar, your dad, you knew all this. You knew what's right and wrong. You know about humility. You know how you should live. You know how you should be serving, but not you. No, 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 no. You have have been on your high horse all this time. And so, your majesty saw a holy one, a messenger coming down from heaven and saying, sorry, let me me come over here. The dream. Um, All this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace, he said, is not this great Babylon I have built as the royal uh, residence? Uh, By my mighty power and for my glory, 
And in that moment, Nebuchadnezzar loses his, he loses everything, loses his mind, loses his way. You knew all this, you knew all this, but you didn't do anything about it. So, um, your majesty, the most high God gave your father Nebuchadnezzar sovereignty and greatness, glory and splendor because of his high position. Uh, but you, Belshazzar, his son, have not humbled yourself, though you knew all this. Instead, you have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You had the goblets from the temple brought in. You praised the gods of silver, gold, bronze, iron, wood, stone, which cannot see or hear or understand, but you did not honor the God who holds in his hand your life and all your ways. Therefore, the inscription that was written says that you have been, your days have been numbered, your ways have been weighed, and you have been found wanting. And this is the end for you, Belshazzar. Belshazzar dies that night. Someone in his royal entourage kills him. And Daniel says, as he reads out that prophecy, that your whole kingdom is going to be put into the hands of the Medes and the Persians. It's Darius who comes to take leadership. He's a Mede. And so the whole kingdom, the whole kingdom splinters in that one night because of a person who would not get off his high horse. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. He gives grace to the humble. Commonplace. The culture knows it. It's why we have the saying, get off your high horse. Don't posture yourself in a way that is kind of superior to others. But this is harder than it appears. Because internally, we are all processing. Am I safe here? Am I good? Do they, do they think well of me? All manner of stuff. And we have a higher view of ourselves than we ought. So getting down off our high horse requires living our lives in God's hands, knowing that we're good, we're okay. Knowing that God has control over all things, that he reigns over everything. Uh, in uh, Cornell University, they did some incredible research. Um, a, a guy by the name of Thomas uh, Gilovich, he researched a million senior high school students, and he asked them questions about their leadership and their relationships. He asked them a question about their leadership. Do you reckon that you are an average leader, an above average leader, or a below average leader? A million students, a million senior high school students. 70% of them said, I'm an above average leader. Now, you don't need to know a lot of math to know that that's a problem. 70% said, I'm above average as a leader. Only 2% said, I'm below average. Only 2%. When, they, when he came to talk about relationships, you know, how well do you relate to other people? How well do you get along with other people? Everybody of a million students said, better than average, better than average. Well, there's, there's the challenge, isn't it? We, we all wire ourselves in that way. We, 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 we all think in that way. A full 60% of that million students said, I reckon I'm in the top 10% when it comes to relating to others, getting on with others, you know? A full 25% said, I reckon I'm in the top 1%. I reckon I'm at the top of the heap. One out of four said, I relate better than 99% of the people. Well, then why do we live in the world that we live in? Why do we have the strife that we have? Why is it like it is? You might be thinking, yeah, they're high school students, you know, come on. So he also interviewed the professors. And 94% of them reckon that they taught better than the average teacher in the school. <laughs> it, it, is, it is just what's, it's what bubbles up in us. It's why we need to be intentional in this humility exercise. I mean, we need to think about putting on humility like clothing. Because it, it isn't natural and simple. We will look for a high horse to get on. We will seek ways to make ourselves secure and safe. And what we are being, being invited to do is exactly the opposite, to get off the high horse, to, to reckon with the fact that my leadership is average, if not 
below average. My, my ability to relate with others, I mean, everybody can't be above average. That just doesn't work. And so all of this statistical stuff is saying to me, ooh, be careful. Because there's a lot inside me that is going to imagine I'm doing better than I am. This is why humility is so difficult, because I think I'm already there. I think I'm already humble. And that is the problem. C.S. Lewis says, if you want to work on humility, I can tell you where to start. Know that you're proud. That's where you start. Know, know that there is pride working. And some days you don't even see it. And that this is what we bring to God in prayer. This is what we wrestle with in the journey of life. This is what we work on. It's why we need to be in community with people who are different from us, because that's where we begin to see, oh my goodness, I really am on my high horse. I can't, I can't, what I just said, and someone mirrors it back. The thoughts that I'm dealing with, the wrestling I'm having. The commonplace of humility in our culture is the very simple idea of getting off your horse. Getting off your high horse and recognizing that all of humanity created in God's image, there is respect, that there, there is a, a regard for each other, there is a, a bringing ourselves down to the same level so that we can engage and support one another and care for one another. Now, that's your horse. I want to talk for just a few moments as we land about your cross. Getting off your high horse is the common calling to humility. Everybody needs to do this. And if everybody would do this, just think for a moment, would the world not be a dramatically different place if everybody was humble in this way? Well, why do we need to be humble in this way? Well, interestingly, God is humble. Come to me. I, I will give you rest. I'll give you a yoke that is easy. My, my, my ways, my life, my heart is gentle and humble. We serve a God who is humble. And so to image that God in our living, we need to be humble. And if the whole of humanity would in one collective moment get off its high horse, we would, we would be experiencing the kingdom of God. Now, here is the problem. There's a lot of people on high horses. There's a lot of people who are overtly, pretentiously, aggressively on high horses. There's a lot of people who are unbeknownst to, to myself. I was just on my high horse there, wasn't I? Oh, I am so sorry. It's everywhere. And that is why those who are followers of Jesus need to take a cross and pursue a calling where you engage with humility at the, at, at the next deeper level. You go deeper with humility. This isn't just get off your high horse, be eye to eye with everyone else, respect each other. This is give something that costs. Pour out something of yourself. Suffer for the kingdom of God. And this is calling. It is specific. It is focused. We get into a lot of trouble when we apply the idea of humility and cross-bearing to all issues of life. Because if you don't understand this is calling, you're very likely to think, wherever you're feeling pain or suffering, oh, that's my cross, the cross I'm bearing for Jesus. It might have nothing to do with the cross that your discipleship calls you to. In fact, I've had conversations with people, and you have too, who complain about their bitter pain, and you can see clearly it's because they're on their high horse. It's because they're on their high horse, and the way they are living and the way they are making demands, it's got nothing to do with the sufferings of the gospel. But if you and I can get off our high horses, and then, and then, ask God, where do you want me to practice humility at the next level for the sake of your kingdom. This is a calling. This is focused work. It's different in different parts of the world, in different generations of life, 
in different personality experiences, in different families. This is why you can't just compare and say, we all need to be like that. No, it's, it's unique and shaped to each discipleship journey. But I know this, every follower of Jesus needs to have a deeper level of humility relative to some area of calling. That's what the whole text in 1 Peter chapter 5 is about. It's about suffering. It's all about suffering. Beware of the devil. Resist him. Put your cares and your worries into God's hands. You'll suffer for a little while, and then God is going to show you his glory. It is amazing. But I want you to suffer for the sake of the kingdom of God. I want you to be more humble in a specific, focused way that I will call you to so that, so that people on high horses will be deposed, so that people who are getting trampled on will be protected, so that my kingdom can advance. So do you see the simple picture? As people continue on their high horses, some people need to go even lower to serve God's kingdom. Now, this is where we get into trouble. Sometimes people read the New Testament and they hear all these passages and they think, so you just want me to be a doormat? You just like, I'm just meant to just lay down and let everybody trample over me? Not at all, not at all. Because it's a calling, because it's specific, because it's focused. A Christian will have a particular area of their lives where they're being quite intentional about being safe. They're embedded in a community. They are saying no to certain behaviors. They are, they are you know, really working on safety and health. None, none, none of the teachings of Jesus say that abuse is fair game. Never. None, none of the teachings of Jesus say, lay down and be a doormat. But what they do say is to pay attention to God's call in your life. Because somewhere, God is asking you to bear the burdens of someone else, to carry a pain or a suffering, to in some way expend yourself for the kingdom. And you need in your 30 minutes a day with Jesus to be exploring this space and listening and receiving from God. You, you can't just hear someone else's story and say, oh, I need to be like that. You, you need to receive from God. And there is some place that God is asking you to go the second mile. There's some place that God is inviting you to go to a deeper level of humility. That's the cross that Christ calls us to bear. And this is what Jesus himself did. Jesus himself humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. Because the God we serve is humble. The God who loves us, embraces us, into humility and asks us to be this way toward each other. All right, work on humility. What does it mean? Clothe yourself with humility. Get off your high horse. Be face to face, eye to eye. Stand with others. Oh, wouldn't it be awesome if your entire workplace got off their high horse and everybody together, you know, pulled in the same direction? Wouldn't it be amazing? If, if everybody in the extended family got off their high horse for just one meal, wouldn't it, be, wouldn't it be awesome? This is not easy to get off our high horse because it's written into the DNA. And everybody around the table, around the work, around the work table, around the community is by default thinking, I do this better than most people. And so that needs the work of God's grace in our lives, recognizing that we live the whole thing under the mighty hand of God who will keep us safe, who will protect us, and who will help us take the journey so we can get off our high horse. And then as a follower of Jesus, you and I are asked to do something else. We're asked to discern a calling of cross-bearing. Where, Lord Jesus, do you want me to be more humble than what is commonplace? To be to be down even lower, underneath the pains of other people, so that the boot of the bully on the high horse strikes me instead of a very vulnerable person who couldn't take another kick. Where do you want me to be, Lord?
in the work of your kingdom. And it's specific, and it's focused, and it's hard, and we resist it. And it's so easy to say, oh, I, really? And that's what Peter is talking about when he says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and he will lift you up in due time. Because nobody who bears a cross for Jesus' sake in the walk of discipleship with God holding them in their hands ever gets crushed completely. This is where we have to lean hard on the story of the resurrection, which is the truth of every Christian story, every Christian life. How could I possibly put my life in harm's way? How could I possibly be that humble for somebody? Because you, because you have life and life eternal. You have resurrection hope. You have a God who will show up in the most amazing ways and everything changes. And that is how we walk in humility. Can I invite us to stand as we just take a moment and ask God's Holy Spirit to uh, help us to um, just, just enable us to connect? It would be wonderful if we all went to our workplaces on Monday and into all the activities of our lives more humble, more humble. It is what God calls us to. And the, the big thing that God wants to say to us is, you're under my mighty hand. You are good. There is a lot of capacity for God's people to be humble and more humble. I've got you. So first, get off your high horse. Alan, get off your high horse. Get, get at a level where you really, really do believe that I've created everybody, there are people in my image, and together we walk in flourishing relationships. And then, to every one of you here today who is a follower of Jesus Christ, to every one of you who would say, Jesus is my Savior and He is my Lord, ask God where He wants you to practice a deeper humility for the sake of the kingdom. Ask Him where He wants you to suffer in a way that is productive. You may not see it in the short term, but God has you in the long term. God opposes the proud. He's opposing the proud all over the world. Sometimes his timeline, we think, oh my goodness, God, could you oppose the proud a little quicker? Could you, could you just kind of... And he asks us to be a part of his glorious hope for the world standing with Jesus Christ in the place where our compassion, our love, our humility is the very rescue for somebody in some way in God's hands. Heavenly Father, how grateful we are for your incredible love, for the good news that, that all creation is being renewed and that we in Jesus Christ, through the forgiveness of our sin and the embrace of your spirit, we are being saved. How we thank you, Lord God, that our very lives, our, our choice to be humble, serves your purpose in the world and brings glory and honor to your name. For just a little while, you call us to suffer. So God, help us to, to really take hold of that which you are asking of us in very specific ways today. This message will have a very particular taste for every person here, a very particular application. It will cause some joy. It will stir up some challenge. Holy Spirit, come. Speak to our hearts. Speak into our lives. Lead us, guide us, show us what you would have us to do. Where do we need to exercise the humility of our specific calling in Christ? In family, in the neighborhood, on the public stage, in a very private and unseen place. Lord, speak to each of our hearts. And with the calling to take up our cross, give us a wonderful picture of your glory a wonderful confidence of your sustaining grace, that we can put our worries into your hands, that we can stand firm in the face of the devil's wiles, that we can know your surrounding grace in the community of believers and know that Christians all over the world 
are suffering redemptively, purposefully, in the work of the kingdom for the glory of our Lord God. Speak to your church today, Lord. Lead us, equip us, help us. Father, as we, as we come to you, give us healing, give us joy, and give us every resource of your Spirit's work in our lives. Make us to be humble for the sake of your glory. In Jesus we ask it. Amen.